So our first um, speaker or our presenter for this month's meeting is Dr. Jason Ryan. Dr. Ryan is a vascular surgeon and he's also the BMC2 vascular surgery physician champion at Ascension Borges. Dr. Ryan is gonna talk to us today about aortic arch types. So Dr. Ryan, I believe Pam's gonna give you control of the screen so um, you can start your presentation. All right, very good. Um, good morning, thanks for having me. As mentioned, I'm Jason Ryan. I'm a vasco surgeon at Borges, Ascension Borges Hospital in Kalamazoo. Been here for uh, about five years now. Um, I was asked to talk this morning about aortic arch types. Um, I sort of made the assumption that uh, for data abstraction and different things, there may be, you, you may be asked to pick out arch types as part of the classifications for things. And so it it's, it's, should be fairly brief, but try to make sense of uh, how to discern an, an arch type um, and uh, why, why, they're, why, why it actually matters. Uh, let's see here. I have no disclosures to discuss. So before we get into the different classifications between like a type one, two, and three arch, uh, I wanted to go over a little bit of the anatomy. This is a cadaveric representation of a aortic arch. Um, the brachiocephalic trunk or the innominate artery uh, um, is uh, same thing, um, would be the first branch followed by the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery uh, in that depiction. Um, Typical arch anatomy, uh, this is the, the standard, what we think of when we think of uh, a normal or quote unquote normal aortic arch. Uh, and this, this configuration of vessels occurs in about 75% of individuals where you have the first branch uh, as we ascend up the, up, the arter, up the aorta being the innominate artery, which branches into the right subclavian and the, and the right carotid, followed by the left carotid coming directly off the aorta followed by the left subclavian coming directly off the aorta. And again, that's the, the most common configuration that you'll see when you look at CT scans uh, in patients. The next most common would be uh, what we call, or what, what is known as a bovine arch. Um, this happens in about 20% of individuals, uh, and I don't know that we exactly know why, um, but in this, as you can see, there's only two trunks coming off of the aortic uh, arch. There's the innominate artery, which also, in this case, gives off the left carotid and then the left subclavian. So rather than having the left carotid come directly off the aorta, it now comes off this common trunk. Interestingly, and I didn't know this as I was putting this presentation together, I'm not sure where the bovine term came from. Um, you would think it's because this is how cows are set up, but it turns out that in the cows have one giant trunk and all their all of their arteries come off of one trunk, which doesn't happen very often in the in the humans. So I'm not sure why they named it this, other than you know there's more of a common trunk. But truly, in cows, it's it's one massive trunk, and it gives branches to all uh, all four vessels. Um, so this was sort of the the meat and potatoes. These next couple of slides, as far as determining an arch type, I think one of the problems you may run into and uh, is that if you're trying to abstract an arch type out of, uh, out of a chart, it's not something that's commonly discussed in a normal radiology report. Uh, I mean, myself, when I look at an angio or an image, I don't typically verbalize this is what the arch type is. It's something you kind of think about if you're looking at a CT scan to try to determine whether or not a patient would be suitable for an intervention, um, uh, a transfemoral intervention. But it's probably not necessarily something that gets recorded very often in the in the medical record. So um, there's a few different ways to look at it, and I'll tell you which one I think is the easiest. This is one that I found in the textbook about um, uh, how to classify the arch. And so what they did was they drew a line right across the apex of the aortic arch, right at the top. Um, they used the diameter of the common carotid artery and then started doing measurements from there and said, basically, if you, if, if you drop down one diameter of the carotid artery, um, look at how many of the arch vessels lie below or lie within that window. So as you can see in, in picture one, all of the arch vessels come off at the same, uh, at the same uh, uh, level there, which 
makes that a type one arch. The more vessels you have below that line or within that window, uh, the further along the types you progress. So um, uh, if you go a couple centimeters below, now you've got the nominate artery below in this window, you would call that a type two arch. And over here, you've got uh, more than one or more than one vessel below that line, calling it a type three arch. That to me, if trying to measure the diameter of the common carotid artery and figure out how low does it drop and all that kind of stuff seems a little bit cumbersome and confusing. Um, I think this is a little bit easier. If you just draw a line straight across, the most common type of arch is a type one arch where all the vessels are gonna come up in the straight line or relatively straight line. As long as it's close, you would still consider this to be a type one arch uh, uh, in that first depiction. If you draw another line down at the, so we call it like the greater curve, the one being on the outside and the lesser curve, meaning the one on the inside, if you just sort of draw parallel lines, if all your vessels are coming off near the top line, you're at a type one. If you have one that drops below, you're at a type two. And if all three of them or two out of the three of them drop below, then you're, uh, then you sort of have a type, then you have a type three arch. Um, uh, the majority, as I said, end up being type one. Next most common is type two. And uh, third most common being type three, where there's a steep angle. And the reason it matters, it, it really doesn't matter for anything other than if you're going to do interventions from uh, a transfemoral or transradial approach. So if you're going to have to navigate the arch with a catheter in the wire, you can sort of imagine as a, for a type one arch, if you're coming up from the groin and you needed to get a wire or a sheath or whatever to go up any of these arch vessels, it's a pretty straight shot coming through here. There's not wild angles or anything like that. But if you come all the way over here to the, to the type three arch, if you're coming up from the groin and you're going to try to get a wire and a catheter to go into the anominate artery or even the left carotid, it's taken some pretty good S curves and bends and, um, it can be really difficult just from a technical uh, standpoint to get uh, to even get sheaths and wires to go into those arteries just because of the angles that they're coming off. Um, another fun fact that I found while I was putting this together that I actually did not know that we're all born with a type one arch. So when we're born, it's pretty standard that the arch is going to be all the vessels are going to be coming off in a straight line. And what what the working theory as to why some people develop uh, a down, uh, sort of a downward pull, if you will, is that the aortic arch is sort of fixed in the chest. And if you have longstanding aortic uh, stenosis or uh, cardiac hypertrophy, the weight of the heart literally sort of dangles from the aorta and almost pulls it down um, into that downward trajectory. Um, there's a much higher incidence of type 2 and type 3 arches in patients who have long-standing hypertrophy, uh, long-standing aortic stenosis, um, which is thought to then, pre you know, most of those patients are also the same ones at risk for vascular disease. So we tend to see a lot of those on CT scan um, with the more advanced arches. Um, one of the things that the, when, uh, before TCAR came around, if you were going to do transfemoral stenting, obviously the, the um, arch type came into play uh, quite a bit. So once the ability to perform a T-car um, uh, came around, the difficult arch types or the type two and type three archers was actually one of the indications for, for being high risk um, uh, and uh, being approved in order to do a T-car. Uh, and this was one of the papers that looked at that. So uh, T-car had improved outcomes across the board from transfemoral stenting, which I think we all know. But specifically, if you looked at stroke rates for TCAR compared to stroke rates from transfemoral stenting, they were very similar in the type one arches, but the more advanced arches, which would have taken more navigation, more wire and catheter manipulation in order to get through uh, from the groin, uh, those patients tended to have a higher risk of a stroke than a TCAR, which is what led uh, us to be to say that makes it a high risk procedure and TCAR would therefore be beneficial in the, the patients with the more advanced arch types. Um, similarly, along the same lines, if you're doing a transfemoral procedure uh, and navigating the arch, as you would expect, the more progressed the arch type, the longer the procedural times, it takes longer to get the catheter to, to go in there, the sheet to go in there, they tend to flip out a little bit if there's all those angles, um, and the longer time under anesthesia uh, led to more adverse events. So I think most of us, if we're going to do a procedure navigating the arch, um, 
you know, look at the sagittal view on a CT scan, try to figure out if it looks like it's going to be um, really st steep angles in the in the more advanced arches and try to figure out if there's a different way to do it. These would be what you would look for on a CT scan if you're going to try to figure out on your, uh, you know, without the radiologist help, what, what type of arch are we looking at? Again, if you just draw a straight line across the top, um, across the top of the arch here, you can kind of see in this case, at least two of those vessels are coming off below. So this, these both would probably be type three arches. The same thing in the, the 3D reconstruction here. If you drew a line straight across the top, actually all three of those vessels are coming off below. And you can imagine that would be a little bit difficult to navigate um, from, the, from either a transradial approach or from a femoral approach. Um, so just to kind of recap, you're... Um, uh, type 1 arch is where all the or, uh, great vessels originate in the same horizontal plane. Uh, type 2 is where one of the vessels or the innominate artery, the first one drops below, and then type 3 arch, you have the innominate artery and the uh, left carotid below the outer curve. Uh, and again, I, you know, I looked in multiple different places. There's not a standard classification for how to figure it out. When I was a fellow, I remember sort of learning just draw one line straight across, forget the bottom one, but if you draw one line across, if they're all in the same plane, it's one. If there's one below, it's two. And if there's more than one below, it's three. Um, that, uh, that makes it so you don't have to measure distances from carotid and get very fancy with it. It's just a very crude way to classify, uh, you know, a more advanced uh, arch type and kind of give you a, a guide going forward with treatment strategies for, uh, for patients. <clears throat> 